All right, welcome everyone to today's webinar where we're going to take a look at the risks in managing SMSF pensions. Now, our pension commencement documents on the Smarter SMSF platform are arguably our most popular uh, in terms of the documents that are used that. And at the moment, our investment strategies had a pretty heavy workout over the past 12 to 18 months. But pensions is an area of growing importance in my view. And, and the reason why will really come out in today's session. And as to why it is important that we are spending the right time, effort and energy, not only understanding the rules, but effectively implementing income streams for our clients and managing those because that life cycle of a pension has expanded quite dramatically over the last few years. We can, you know, if we think about it, we've got non-retirement phase income streams now and they morph into retirement phase income streams. We've then got longevity issues that we think about with clients. Uh, the fact that they then may revert or they may not revert with death benefit pensions and so forth. So these are all part and parcel of what I would refer to as the life cycle of a pension, let alone when we think about the life cycle of an SMSF. Now, as is always the case, we include our disclaimer to help you understand the context in which we are providing today's session to you. So what are we going to be covering today? So we're going to be taking a look at the state of play where I see pensions currently in this day and age, the issues and risks around that I see also with pension documents. Quite often I'm talking to uh, people around uh, the, the fact that we may not have pension documentation available, the fact that the pension documentation is clearly insufficient, uh, it may be missing. Uh, so there are a range of things that we need to contemplate. Then what we're going to do is I want to then step you through an analysis of our smarter SMSF pension documents and why we have built them in a particular way and how they align back to what the Commission has provided, in particular with TR 2013-5, what the governing rules say as well. And then, of course, we've got a range of measures that happened from the 1st of July 2007, but then also 2017. Now, I've got live demo next, but I will be basically interchanging backwards and forwards throughout uh, today, going into, like I said before, our sample documents, our order forms to help you better understand how and why we put these certain building blocks in play and then talk to you a little bit as we finish off about not only the pension suite of documents that we have, but why ultimately people rely upon us to assist you with this type of work. So let's get stuck into it and first and foremost, look at the state of play with pension documents. And the reality is, is as the industry has matured, we are now starting to fill up that historical gap in the provision of available compliance documents. And this is a general um, uh, comment that is being made here. The fact that we have an ever-evolving type of investments and now with different stages of far more mature retirement phase stage as well, that we need to accommodate. So we think about transition to retirement income streams, we think about account-based pensions that are being paid. And we now also note that we have different rules and requirements around death benefit income streams too. And we need to be able to cover each and all of those different aspects. Now, what comes with this, of course, is an increased focus on documentation to be able to manage the legal risk that comes about with documentation and the compliance risk within SMSFs. And this has been highlighted over the past decade or more, in particular with binding death benefit nominations and the growing level of interest that um, parties are having around the pool of assets that may become available in the event of a member's death. And we only need to be looking um, at, the, at the current standing where we have a case before the High Court, uh, the Hill versus Zuda case, that may then determine again a change in the landscape around whether non-lapsing binding death benefit nominations will actually be able to continue or not in the future because we will have this Commonwealth piece of legislation that will enable us to determine whether 
we do have and can continue to have non-lapsing binding nominations or do SMSFs need to actually go back and comply with the requirements within section 591A and 617 in the CIS regs. So what we also know and have seen in the past few years is the expectations by the regulator on documenting decisions. Investment strategies is a good example there. And therefore that expectation on the gatekeepers being our auditors to be able to support various decisions. And this also goes to things like pension decisions. And we think about in the past couple of years with a 50% reduced COVID minimum, we have obligations to look at how we might want to treat amounts that are above the minimum. And again, documentation to this is ultimately going to support whether that type of strategy can be implemented based upon the prospective decisions that have been made to be able to make that election in the first place. And that goes back to views of the commissioner that were set out within PCG 2017-5, back when the super reforms were introduced and we needed to commute those income streams back to uh, meet those $1.6 million transfer balance cap requirements at that point in time too. Now, the other observation obviously here is, is there is a continued heavy reliance upon the software providers to be able to support you as a practitioner with various templates. And this in particular includes SMSF pensions. And ultimately what we have here is a, it's either little or no alignment to the funds governing rules. It's not the software provider's role to be providing you templates that link up intrinsically with your SMSF trustee. They do it because there's requests for that to occur, but ultimately this is not the caper that they're in and, um, and shouldn't necessarily be responsible for providing the information to you. It is your job to ensure that you are managing that risk and responsibility in terms of aligning all the decisions of your SMSF into the governing rules of the fund. And that obviously includes the commencement and management of income streams as well. And the other observation over time is that if we're not relying upon SMSF software to do that, and we may not already be using a provider like Smarter SMSF to deliver these type of templates and documents, we then see firms create internal templates for things like pension commencements that endeavour to align to the fund's deed. Now, I go back a decade or more when I was in practice and you know, we were managing four, five, six hundred funds. And a lot of the things that we did in particular to comply with pensions at that point in time was we did. We built word-based templates and then we would use word merge and so forth to be able to facilitate what we needed to be able to do. And we did that on the basis that we did want to align to the, um, to the trust deed that was being utilised at that point in time. So yes, that's fantastic. Um, do you have the implicit knowledge inside the organisation to be able to achieve that? So it's not necessarily a technical issue. You may be able to produce certain documents to support that process, but maybe it then becomes a more practical consideration in terms of delivering efficient and effective outcomes, whereby you're not leveraging the technology that is now available within the industry. So then I guess, as we go back to those questions, this concept or, or, or um, question that is being asked around the use of SMSF software is a real interesting one. So, because this is the question that we have received previously on uh, numerous occasions, is you know, we do currently prepare pension documents for our clients within our SMSF software. It's the most efficient way for us to do it. But the concern that is starting to brew is that the more I read on this topic, the more I'm starting to question whether this is the right approach we should be taking for our SMSF clients. So what are the potential risks here, if any, in using this approach? So part of what we're going to do here is unpack some of that to help you understand these issues, which is really what we're all about in today's session. So first and foremost, what we need to do is we need to be very clear on the commissioner's view is, views in respect to superannuation income streams. And our Bible when it comes to this is tax ruling 2013 slash five, when a pension commences and ceases. 
Now, one of the most important things to note around the commencement of an income stream, this is set out inside of the, um, of the ruling, is that it talks about here the fact that it must be determined by reference to the terms and conditions of the superannuation income stream agreed by the trustee and the member, the rules of the superannuation income stream as set out in the governing rules. So there's a few parts that we need to unpack here. So we've got determined by reference to the terms and conditions of the superannuation income stream. One, it must be agreed to by the trustee and the member. So we need to have this contractual arrangement or agreement in place, and it must be consistent with the rules that have been set out within the fund's trustee. So our rule in 25 of the Smarter SMSF deed talks about the provision and payment of benefits. Okay, and what we have in here is, is that we have a fairly loosely and deliberately worded um, requirement around the payment of benefits so that if the rules do change, we're not going to need to have to make an amendment every time that there is a small adjustment to the rules. So in this instance here, subject to the super laws without limiting the powers of the trustee under 25.1, the following super benefits may be paid um, by the trustee to the member. And then there's an ability in A there where there's a nil cashing condition being met, they can take a lump sum or commence an income stream. And it goes on um, throughout there. So the questions you really have to ask yourself here, are, well, what are the terms and conditions that are being referenced to within the income stream that has been commenced? So are they explicitly set out within the pension documents? or are they silent and rely upon a reference back to the funds trustee? And what is a common occurrence that I do see here is that we end up in a bit of a circular argument. And what I mean by that is that the funds deed talks about the fact that we have the ability to pay a pension and it's quite broad and deliberately quite broad so that there's not an adjustment, as we said before, each and every time that there is an amendment to the superannuation laws. But then what we get to is when we get to our pension documents, our pension documents don't have enough prescription within them. And what it says is that we can start and manage, run that pension in essence, in accordance with the rules of the fund. So we have this whole circular argument of saying, well, the, the fund rules say we can start a pension and expect to have a prescriptive set of terms and certain terms and conditions that will set that out. And then on the flip side, the pension documents are saying, yeah, no, no worries, we can pay a pension, we pay it in accordance with the deed. And that's where you can potentially come up with some problems whereby there is no construct as to how the pension should actually operate. So the question here it is next is how does the deed define how the agreement is to apply to actually start that pension. So different providers will have different ways in which that pension commencement needs to actually be documented. Documented. So does it have to be done by deed or some form of agreement, legal agreement? Or simply can it be done by resolutions? Or is there some other mechanism that allows for that to occur? Now, as I said before, and it was set out in TR 2013-5, it must be a two-way agreement that occurs, whatever the case may be. So we need a contractual arrangement to be signed and agreed to between the member and the trustee. If we don't have that contractual agreement, we don't actually have a pension that would be on foot. So you can't simply have that the trustee resolves to start a pension for John. Simply doesn't work. We don't actually have a contractual arrangement whereby we have a member's request to start that pension, and we then have the consent of the trustee for that to occur. And that becomes important because once we establish the contractual arrangement, that contractual arrangement can therefore be altered where it's agreed to between those two parties to do so. And I'll come to that a little bit later. So also what type of income stream that can be paid, again, would be relevant there and do any special rules around that pension apply, conditional pensions, um, certainly in blended families is an example there. And if you're using your standard SMSF software pension documents, 
are you or have you reviewed these against the deed that you may have for that client or you might use within that firm to ensure that you're not posing any risk to the operation of that income stream? So what could be challenged in this scenario? So is there a situation whereby the ECPI of that income stream could be challenged by virtue of the operation of, the, of that pension and the documents that support that income stream? Probably unlikely. Now, but could the reversionary status of that income stream be challenged in the event that there was a, a contest in respect to the will and the reversionary may be a second or third or fourth spouse um, and we have children from that first, second, maybe third marriage who are, are contesting who is entitled to receive that death benefit. So as has been the case with binding death benefit nominations, it won't be too long until there's a challenge on the reversionary status of that income stream and therefore saying, was that pension actually established correctly? And if that pension wasn't established correctly, then does it pose a, an ability for that to be challenged, cease that pension, and therefore we would need to look at any death benefit nominations that were in play to determine how that death benefit would be paid out. And again, we've got all these lessons from the courts in respect to binding death benefit nominations here um, around the validation, the link back to the deed, the validation of the death benefit nomination itself. Has it followed in form and substance in respect to how that nomination was in play? And we've got the Cantor Management one, which was talking about, talked about how it was served upon the trustees. We've got Munro's case that had incorrect terminology. And we had Dawson's case, which looked at the various roles here around enduring powers of attorney and LPRs and the decisions as to when and where people were required to leave. So all these, again, are critically important here from a procedural aspect and the information that will be required to validate the operation of that income stream. And Narriman was another example um, whereby there was it was questioned as to whether that pension was actually on foot and therefore the reversionary would be able to continue where we actually didn't have pension documents. And it was able to be established based upon the body of evidence that that pension actually was on foot and remained on foot. And only because of that were we able to um, demonstrate there that that pension could continue as, as reversionary. So, so in my view, pension documentation compliance here should be upheld to exactly the same standard that we uphold with our binding death benefit nominations. So the other really interesting one that we get a lot of questions on as well is around PDSs for pensions in particular, but obviously self-managed funds. So do we actually need a PDS when a pension is established? Now, what the law says and what you should be doing is potentially two different things. Now, the Corporations Act here requires a PDS to be issued when a member converts from accumulation phase or growth phase they refer to into the pension phase. So this is set out in Section 1012B of the Corporations Act. Now, what we do know is there is a limited exemption within the Corporations Act if it can be found that on reasonable grounds, we believe that the member has received or has and knows they have access to all of the information that the PDS would be required to contain. And that is set out in section 1012D. So the problem here though, is how many of you have pension clients or your SMSF clients that have all the information um, and have access to all the information and have the knowledge to know what is required for that pension to be able to pay, be paid to them as a member. And we've got things here of the issuing of that by virtue of the trustee and the fact that we actually have a financial product here, which is under 1012A of the Corporations Act. So the risk that I pose to you here that exists is if you've made the decision for the client, in essence, by producing the pension documents, by not issuing a PDS with the pension commencement documents, then are you putting your own practice at risk by not having done so with that? And again, if we come back to those previous risks that we spoke about before. So in my view, the default position that we take 
with our generation of pension documents and the default position that you should be taking is that the client's understanding as a member is insufficient. So therefore, by default, we are going to issue a product disclosure statement when someone commences a superannuation income stream. Um, and this is something, sure, the legislation around issuing a PDS has been around for a long time, but it's something that still creates a range of activity inside the industry, as you can see by um, an article that was posted late last year on this very issue as well. And again, just noting that the SMSF software that you're using does not provide a PDS because there's really no connection back to a specific deed as to its governing rules and therefore the features and benefits of the type of pensions that could be paid. So again, risk management here for you becomes a really critical issue. So what should that PDS include? Things like the type and the term of pension, um, the admin tax, legal, actuarial considerations in establishing and running the income stream, advantages, disadvantages of the pension, the commutability of that pension, reversionary nature, estate planning implications and the like. So I'm just gonna jump now across to um, our pension, where are we? Yep. Just wanna show you, I'll come back to those documents there shortly. But in essence, what we do have here is our product disclosure statement. So this is one that has been specifically built for superannuation income streams and again, goes through the requirements under the um, Corporations Act, talks about accessing superannuation benefits, the ability to pay the pension, um, the fact that we have different types of pensions, in particular, an account-based pension, we have minimum pension obligations. Um, in the current version that we have attached to the pension, it, of course, will have the temporary minimums there. This is just off our um, sample inside of our um, knowledge base the details around reversionaries and who can be a reversionary, uh, implications if you decide to segregate specific assets. We then talk in some depth about the superannuation reforms and the concepts of retirement phase, transfer balance cap, debits and credits. So you get the drill. So, and reporting obligations, uh, taxation of benefits, et cetera, et cetera. So this should be something in my view that every pension member should be getting when they commence that income stream to ensure that they have the relevant information to enable them to have made that decision to be able to commence that pension and again we get them to sign that to acknowledge that they've actually read that that um, pds in relation to the commencement of that income stream so let's go back to our slides again and keep moving so one of the important aspects that we do with our pension documents is that inside of the Smarter SMSF trustee, we can actually have certain documents become what we call a special rule of the fund. And that is set out in rule 1.8 that you can see on the screen on the right hand side. And what the special rule um, of the fund allows us to do is, is in essence annex any document that we see as being important to in essence become declared as something that is attached to the existing rule. So in essence, become another rule to the fund, okay? And you can see down there, it talks about that may allow the trustee to add very otherwise alter or amend rules. And as we go down further, any additional rule may become a special rule of the fund if declared by the trustee as such and may not be varied by any variation of these rules unless there is the specific consent of the trustee member affected by that rule. So why is this important? This becomes really important because it then gives us the flexibility and opportunity to make variations to the terms and conditions of that pension. And when we think about why we might want to do that, in, in my view, I can see two very clear scenarios. One is around pre 1 January 15 pensions where the individuals may be receiving age pension entitlement and there is now a legislative change after that date that would impact by commutation of repurchase, it would impact the age pension and assessment for income test purposes. The other one, a bit more relevant in today's day and age is around compliance with the transfer balance cap where many clients had to commute back and now have an accumulation account sitting next to their retirement phase income streams. 
So again, if we had to go through a process of making an amendment to a pension, we would then be rolling back into what I'd call a contaminated stage of accumulation. So if we actually had multiple income streams running, then we would need to roll those back. And then when we repurchase, we are now repurchasing with, again, potentially some of that contaminated taxable component that may be sitting in accumulation phase. So making an amendment such as removing or adding a reversionary won't taint any of those two situations. And we can do that therefore simply by agreements between the trustees and the members to the pension documents that have been established that have been set out as a special rule of the fund. So let's now go and um, have a look through some of the ways in which we have set up and structured our form and how that will then translate into the generated document. So our pension commencement form is fairly unique. Um, um, in unique, what I mean is in a couple of ways. One is that we actually have the ability in the pension commencement to commence all three different types of pensions, account-based pensions, transition to retirement income streams, and death benefit pensions. So not reversionaries, we've got a separate document that deals with that, but you have the ability to start any one of those pensions. And we actually have a whole range of smarts inside this pension that as you work through, will start to determine what type of income stream is relevant. Now you have the ability to use integrations with Simple Fund 360 and class to actually pre-populate details of those income streams. Um, importantly note, you would set up that pension information inside the SMSF software first. And then what it's going to do is it's going to pull through information around the fund, the member starting the pension, the trustee information, the class integration does actually pull through the pension data as well. At this stage, we're working with BGL on endpoints to get that uh, populated as well for Simple Fund 360. And it's these smarts that we then have that is a bit unique to um, what we have put in play. And these are around things like conditions of release that then dictate the type of pensions that can be paid. So if you work through that document and the age of the individual comes out that they are 65 or older, then you're not going to get the ability to commence a TRIS. It will then simply default that option to the condition of release being met at the attaining age 65. And also on the basis that that nil cashing condition has been met, then you'll only be able to populate what is unrestricted non-preserved benefits rather than it filling the bucket of restricted non-preserved benefits. So it allows for the member to purchase either with the entire balance of that income stream or it can be through a lower purchase price if you're not using the entire balance. So there is a concept within the documents that says, you know, Joe Citizen here has a million dollars in his superannuation interest but he's actually deciding to start a benefit with $750,000. And we will work out inside that pension um, documentation what the proportions of the superannuation interest is and then how that will apply to the actual commencement of that income stream as well. So it calculates those tax-free and taxable proportions from the components. It does the minimum pension factor calculation also does calculations based upon having started throughout the year on a pro rata basis, including temporary reduced minimums for the various years, and will apply maximums either at 100% or 10%, again, based on the type of pension that exists as well. Now, a couple of things where our forms then kind of step out beyond what you would see in SMSF software land is that there are then flexibility in pension payment options, both in amount and frequency. So I'm just going to jump back into the form for a second here. Um, so if I just go here, I will get out of that and I'm going to go to our pension document. So this is our platform, obviously. I'm sure many of you maybe online have seen this before. Um, but I just want to take you through the form here and I'm sort of working on some stuff that I started to fill out before, but a couple of things just to note. If you are um, populating yourself, uh, then it will work out. We have an integration that will populate the address for you. So that will then validate that and you'll be able to apply that then 
throughout the rest of the form. So you'll see that in the drop menu there. You also have the ability to put in an other address if you want to fill that out and also a manual address input as well. But it is a time saver to be able to simply put in that specific address um, across multiple areas when we generate the document. So I've got in here now, we'll put in a date of birth, 1509, 19, oops, not 18, 1951, let's say. Uh, click on the actual date here, and then we can see mail, member's address, and then we're going to go into the pension details. Now, what is important as I spoke about on the slide before I jumped in here before, is that it's going to work out some of the information that we have in here. So is this starting from a death benefit? No, it's not. We're going to put in a 1st of July 2021 start date. And what you're going to see now is that it is determined the age of the individual. And you can see the different things on tooltips here, just to say, well, am I using the right document in this instance? But it's now told us that we've met the condition of release of attaining age 65. So therefore, there's no choice box here around the type of pension that would be able to be paid. Now, again, in here, we'd just be putting in whatever those um, components are. This sort of stuff, like I said, will potentially feed in to the software for you. Uh, don't need that much. Um, and then from here, you have the ability to select whether you're using the entire balance. And again, it will do those proportions for you or whether you're going to select a purchase price being an amount less than that. So you can see in here, um, if I just go back to that, actually I might just put in 250,000 just for um, to show you there. And you can now see that reduced minimum on a minimum factor. And this is where we get to the amounts that are going to be taken. So you have here at least a minimum payment or a maximum or specify an other. And we also have a frequency of payment. Now, typically what you'll see in SMSF software is it'll say, I'm going to pay it monthly, I'm going to pay it weekly, I'm going to pay it yearly, and, and that's about it. So the reason why this is so important, just going back to the slides here and the way that we do this to give you those two choices is quite interesting. So it comes back to this, well, can you backdate the pension documents to the start of the year? Well, again, going back to 2013-5 here, we need to ensure that the commencement date cannot occur prior to the date that the, the established, the establishment date as the commencement date as agreed to, as we kind of spoke about before. Um, and what we have with this, I just realized I needed to touch on this before I go back to the other bit, is that we spoke before a bit about the members agreeing, but how we evidence that backdating, um, what we do is in essence, confirm a previous oral request. So in that instance, rather than saying, well, let's just backdate or in hindsight, put that back to the 1st of July, what we're doing here is rather than doing a two-step process where you might produce a document to say, oh, I hereby intend to start it and I'll do it when the accounts are complete to confirm, we are simply taking the condition, the agreement that has occurred between the member and trustee having been done orally. And therefore now when the pension starts, say even at this time of year, we can sign and complete those documents having started at the 1st of July um, because we are simply ratifying what has previously been agreed to between those two. So now let's go back to our pension payments and see why this construct of monthly or annual or at least the minimum of the trustee's discretion is important. So standardised pension documents here may not ultimately provide the flexibility to allocate one pension from one pension to another pension between the members. So the pension standards here, and this is what it says in TR 2013-5, is that the pension standards potentially won't have been met. So if you have a pension that has been established and there is a monthly payment to be made out of that, then you actually still need to ensure that you meet that minimum payment each year and you won't have any ability technically to go, okay, well, let's shift because we're taking more than the minimum out of it. What we're going to do is we're going to reassign part of that money over to pension number two or pension number three, because that is going to be a better outcome. 
And again, this is because we've got to follow what the pension standard and the terms and conditions of the pension actually are. So if you're only required to draw $40,000, but you've set up $5,000 each and every month, then in essence, technically, you need to conform with the terms and conditions of that pension, which have set out um, a monthly payment. So we deliberately set up in our pension documents, I request at the bottom right, you can see here, at least the minimum payment for the year, but do not wish to nominate an amount at this time. And pension payments will be made at the trustee's discretion. So in that instance, if we're going to take the 60,000, but we only want to assign 48 to that, then of course, at the trustee's discretion and the fact that we have only nominated at least a minimum, we have that discretion to reassign those pension benefits prior to the end of the year and finalization of the members' um, accounts for or the, the funds accounts and the members' statements there. And at this point in time, what we're simply doing is asking the directors to advise me of that initial minimum payment to be paid for the income year. So again, just little nuances here, you can start to see what those risks and issues are that we need to contemplate. So going back to the order form, one of the other things that we do have on our form is a choice subject to whether you are using the Smarter SMSF deed or not. And what the choice is, is in essence determines whether there are particular things that are added into the pension document. So we have people that don't use our Smarter SMSF deed, but they do use our pension documents. They use them because they like them. They, they can align um, externally to the deed that they're using and the integrations enable that process to be fast and efficient to get the job done. But if you do use our Smarter SMSF deed, the two important components that do get incorporated into this are, one, the pension becomes a special rule of fund. So I spoke about that earlier, where in essence, we're annexing the pension rules into the governing rules. And the other thing that we have is we have this ability to make the pension commencements a paramount document. So where something becomes a special rule, you have the ability to, in essence, make this a paramount document, which the concept of a paramount document is unique to our deed. And you can see on the right hand side here on the bottom, the explanation of that paramount document means that a document or agreement that is made as a special rule shall take precedence and priority in whole or in part over any other document, agreement or resolution made that may look to deal with this in a different matter. And that can include obviously binding death benefit nominations as well. So for absolute clarity, when we built the revised rules in 2017 to deal with the super reforms, this was something that stood out from a strategic point of view to ensure that we covered, gave you the flexibility and confidence to make sure that if you want reversionaries to rank higher than anything else, then you can make it a paramount document to be able to achieve that particular outcome. So I'm just gonna jump again back into the um, pension document and you'll be able to see um, that under here. So the frequency of payment, is it the discretion, for example? Is it paid under the deed? Um, yes, it is. We have our rule number. So tool tips will also include in most documents, the ability to include that under rule 25 there. Um, and then we have the ability then to move in and finish off the completion of this document in the context of our reversionaries. So whether we have a reversionary pensioner or not, that would be attached to this income stream. And then we also have the ability to determine whether we want to segregate any specific assets as well. So if we do um, have a reversionary, we can add in all of that information, including the relationship, um, and so forth. And then again, whether we want to make that a paramount document or not. So I'm just going to go no and no here for the sake of speed. And then with our segregation here, you can simply say all assets are to remain pooled, or you can list specific assets that have been set aside to um, support the payment of this income stream. So if we go no, we move on. If we say yes, then we can actually link those. And if we go to assets, you'll see Asset number one will always be a bank account or cash to support the rounding of, in essence, those assets, because the total market value, of course, of the segregated assets must be equal to the purchase price. So again, just that quick 
um, uh, sort of summary of, of how the segregation would work there as well. And then ultimately, as you go to produce the pension documents, you have the ability to review the information of that particular order. Um, you can then see all that information in here. You will get an email confirmation of the order in addition to um, uh, just the confirmation that it's been submitted. You'll get this confirmation here as well. And then if you are a member, of course, you don't have to um, pay for that. It will form part of your document subscription through our counter. Otherwise, you'll see a credit card payment here and then you will simply arrange for payment and then submit that order thereafter. So I'll just hit submit anyway, for argument's sake, um, whilst we go back to our slides and keep moving. So one of the things, I guess, again, going back to our um, type of documents and why we do what we do at Smarter SMSF is about our depth of knowledge. So if we look at um, the right-hand side here with pensions, you know, as a specialist, we focus on depth of what we do in SMSF, not breadth of other areas in which we could operate um, as a document provider. So you will see, um, and you and we work with others as they sort of come in and we look at some of the documents that they work with, and we do see some limitations around that based upon the fact that those providers or the way in which they're being done just has this breadth of, of content. Now, it's only once you start to get into working with people that have these special skills and knowledge, do you start to get this alignment right in your firm and therefore the documents that come with it. And where we sit is right down deep in that extended thinking and level four, because it's not just setting up a pension to commence. There is everything that goes around that that potentially ring fences that income stream, but also maximizes the opportunities as well. So it is things like our pension commencements, but it also can cover lost pension deeds, resolutions, above minimum pensions, and then leveraging and tucking that all in with the integrations that are available as well. So a few things about our platform um, that would be relevant for those of you that uh, either A, are clients already, but a bit of a refresher, or those of you that aren't and are thinking about um, having a look at documents. So there is a strong focus from us on automation to be able to create documents. And it's all about how do we save you time? How do we put money back in your pocket without compromising on the leverage of our specialization to ensure that clients are complying? Um, now we do uh, have legal support through Hill Legal, Chris Hill um, with my business partner, Ian, having retired from practice last year, uh, that support now comes through Chris and it was Ian, Chris and myself um, that really built out this current SMSF deed uh, when we rewired it in uh, 2017. So we do have the legal support there to deal with specific issues you may have around deed deficiencies and the like. Um, everything that we do is hosted and managed within Australia. Um, so we use Amazon Web Services. We host and store that data in Sydney around those documents. We do have the ability to provide you with for subscriptions under your document counter, the ability to not only provide one login for you, but link other staff members to be able to order documents under what we call our primary and secondary user functionality. And shortly that primary user will be able to set all that up themselves under their own profile to be able to um, set up additional staff members and remove staff members and set up the level of permissions that those individuals may have as well. Um, if you do simply order on a pay-as-you-go basis, we do uh, accept all forms of payment uh, around Visa, MasterCard and Amex. We all have SSL certificates across all websites for payments quite clearly. We have orders that are delivered by email um, virtually, not quite instantaneously, but pretty quickly thereafter in just a few minutes. And you will always have access to your completed orders through the completed orders page on the site. Um, for members, you have the ability to not only save orders, but if you need to reset um, some orders in terms of making some adjustments, you can do so as well. There's tool tips, as I showed you before, and we have a fairly expansive knowledge base. I showed you the sample document that is sitting on our knowledge base, which you can access at any point in time. Videos on how to order documents that go through and explain the tool tips and so forth, setting up integrations and so forth. And I guess most importantly here is that we are subject each and every year to security um, standards and annual questionnaires around 
compliance with the ATO's operational framework from both class and BGL from an integrations point of view as part of us being an approved add-on through the software marketplaces that each of them have as well. So you do have the ability, as I mentioned, within our Smarter SMSF platform. So you can see here, the completed order is, is generating. Our knowledge base is where you find those sample documents that I spoke to about before. Um, you have the ability to save um, our completed orders and you have the ability to create the different integrations with the software as well. So you can simply go in here, connect to class, um, enable that uh, ability to, if I just go this one, and it will then uh, ask me for the authenticator code. <laughs> so I won't worry about that for now, but you get the drift. So it then gives you the ability to populate um, the order form there as well. So I'm just going to go back to the slides um, as we get towards the end of today's session. So a couple of things, if you are using our software for platform for the first time, there is a registration process, of course, to be able to do so. You, upon that process, you will get a registration or a subscription. Either way, you're going to get a welcome from us. You should always ensure that you um, also click our double opt-in process. It will just make sure that you're going to get all of the emails that will be sent from us um, from tax invoices through to newsletters, all that sort of thing. Um, also, we will try and capture from you uh, a little bit more information, the Power YG sign up and also the sign up through BGL um, is very basic in its initial form. So we do need to get other information maybe about your firm if we haven't got that already. Perfect example, obviously, is when we issue a tax invoice for a pay-as-you-go order that may have been done, it will have the correct information in it. And of course, we've got dedicated support inside of our business to ensure that all new users have access to that to start ordering. So you'll be hearing from David. David will um, get in contact with you, make sure you're all set up, make sure the double opt-in process is done and really get you underway. And you can work with him or any one of our team members to be able to um, make sure that your experience is as you expect it to be. And as I said, our primary and secondary um, user functionality uh, is available now. Uh, we just don't have the UI, the user interface um, available at this point in time. You can see some of that information there. So for those that are current subscribers that may wanna look at using it, you can get in contact with us. Um, and if you are looking at a subscription, we can certainly set that up for you. We'll be showing off some of that um, at the BGL RegTech events and then also at the SMSF Association National Conference in April as well. So I mentioned at the very beginning, when it comes to pensions, it's a lot more than simply pension commencements. We do have a very comprehensive pension commencement suite of documents there that deal with the machinations of TRISs and account-based pensions and death benefit pensions. But there is much more than that. And you can see here the list that currently exists, and I deliberately use the word currently, because there are more still to come. So whether it's conditions of release or lump sums and pensions and rollbacks and commutations, in specie, cash payments, review, annual pension reviews, including to do the above minimum pension election, Trista retirement phase. We have a lost pension deed that follows the decision in Narriman's case where you may want to confirm or affirm that a pension is on foot, minimum pension for shortfalls, dealing with reversionary, so distinct from a death benefit pension, if the pension is reversionary, documentation to continue that income stream, then some specific stuff around adding and removing reversionaries, whether you have pension documents and might want to be used, might be using the Smarter SMSF deed to add those as a special rule of fund, and then you can see a few others down there around market link pensions, conversions, temporary incapacity income streams. So we will be naturally, if the legacy pension conversions come to fruition, putting some work into that documentation as well. But if you do want to have a look at any of these documents, samples and so forth, um, you can get in contact with us. Or if you have access via the platform, you can do so from the knowledge base as well. So why do firms ultimately choose us? Well, it does naturally come with the fact that we are specialists and we, what we do in this space is highly regarded. So 
we are nimble, um, we are in the know when it comes to these changes and developments. It's not just in our training, it then translates into the documents that we produce as well. Who are the types of firms that we work with? Um, well, quite interestingly, we have a fairly wide catchment, but if you drill down, it really comes into what I see as two streams. So we have at the, at the larger end of our subscriptions, we have our higher volume providers, administrators, specialist firms. And what I know that they're looking for in the conversations that we have is that the documents must be best practice. They must be managing risk. They must be doing what the laws need us to be able to do. And once that due diligence has occurred, it needs to give us an efficient and consistent experience because we're going to be ordering these in volumes. So leveraging the integration, doing the order, making sure it works each and every time. Then what we have on the other side is what I refer to as general practitioners. And this is where they want to look at our expertise and give them the confidence of saying, am I actually doing this correctly? So, and once that confidence of saying, well, I actually, I'm going to choose Smarter SMSF because I know that they know what they're doing. And then once that trust has passed and, and we can go and look at using those documents, it then becomes this issue of, well, yeah, sure, now let's tap into and leverage my Simple Fund 360 or let's leverage my class super to be able to do so. So you can order, as I said, on a pay-as-you-go basis, but we also have some fairly highly competitive pricing around our subscription bundles that start from 25 all the way through to an unlimited pack at 500 plus. And the other thing that we're getting a lot of comment on at the moment is the fact that um, with a lot of uh, change in the industry at the moment, in, in particular in this space, some consolidation of some fairly well-known document providers, is that that personalization and support and responsiveness has just simply dropped away. And this is something that we hold very high in the organization. So you can get in contact with, you can get in contact with by phone, you can get track your tickets, um, log tickets, we will get back to you around those tickets. Um, we do track the data in respect to response times, uh, how quickly we are able to resolve these issues as well. We do uh, understand how important your time is and how important the ability to get the work out is. And we try to and endeavor to ensure that we get you moving and focusing on what you do best around that. And that has been a very common theme over the last few months in particular, let alone the fact that there's some question marks, I guess, on the quality of the documents of those providers um, moving forward as well. So as we wrap up, some key takeaways. Now pension phase, and hopefully what I've been able to demonstrate to you today, requires a suite of documents to support the many stages of paying and managing income streams. So it's critical that you make sure that your pension documents here are aligned to your funds governing rules. And it is also imperative to get your pension documentation right to avoid any future potential challenge that may come if the income stream was established and then potentially managed um, in an incorrect way. So you wanna get those documents correct from the very beginning. And then if you're confident and you're doing all those things right, it then comes back to this practical issue of ensuring that you're leveraging the ability to create compliant documents with the um, technology impact of enabling class or Simple Fund 360 to give you the time saving, but most importantly, not compromising on the quality and the management of your client risk, but also your business risk as well. So that's it. Hopefully you've enjoyed today's session. Um, what we have done on our website is we've color coded a whole range of events to help you understand what we have coming up. Um, of course, we'll be at the BGL RegTech events kicking off next week in Sydney and Brisbane. Our green dots talk about our CPD training for those of you that are CPD members with Smarter SMSF. We do have the odd free event that we'll be running throughout the year. Our next one will be uh, the federal budget impacts on SMSF. And as is the case with this session today, our product demos and how we sort of bring the technical and the practical together 
Um, these, we do have another one in April where we're going to be looking at some tips and tricks in ordering SMSF documents as well. So thank you all for being a part of today's session. If you do have any other questions, please let me know. We will send you a copy of the slides after today's session. Other than that, uh, wish you a pleasant weekend. If you're going to be at one of the RegTech events, come up, say good day, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye for now.